Hello everyone, I'm Kevin Kupchinski, planetarium and STEM educator at the Springfield Science Museum. We hope you come to visit the museum soon and we especially look forward to seeing you in our planetarium. Meanwhile, please enjoy this astronomy video. During STEM week, it is easy to focus on ultra-modern technology such as the latest in computers, robotics, and spaceflight. In this video, we're going to back to the roots of STEM and also see a little of the history of a technology that we now take for granted, the calendar. As the calendar developed over the centuries, the timings of some of our most ancient celebrations have been changed. We can see some of this in the history of the holiday we now know as Halloween. Halloween is the best known of the cross-quarter holiday celebrations. In recent years, the connection to the Druid holiday of Samhain has been well publicized. What is not quite as well known is the astronomical connection to this holiday. Cross-quarter days are the days that fall halfway between an equinox and a solstice. As with the equinoxes and the solstices, the cross-quarter days fall astronomically at slightly different times each year. However, by tradition, their dates have been fixed to the same day each year. For example, November 1st for the fall-winter cross-quarter day. The actual cross-quarter day for this time of year occurs around November 7th. Our Western calendar marks the start of each season by the equinoxes and solstices. However, some traditional calendars use the cross-quarter days as the beginning of their seasons. One of these is the traditional Japanese calendar, where winter begins on November 7th on the holiday known as Ruto. The best known of the cross-quarter traditional calendars is the Celtic calendar. The cross-quarter day that falls on our November 1st marked not only the beginning of winter but also their new year. The Celts believed that on the eve of this day, the boundary between the afterworld and our world became very thin, and it was possible for spirits to visit our world. In response to this threat, they lit bonfires to appease the spirits and left food offerings as hospitality. These traditions morphed over the centuries into our current day celebration of Halloween. In observational astronomy, when a star or constellation reaches its highest point in the sky, that is called culmination. The ancient Celts observed Samhain when the star cluster we call the Pleiades culminated exactly at midnight. In the 11th and 12th century, when the Julian calendar was used, the midnight culmination of the Pleiades and the cross-quarter date were the same. However, by that time the Julian calendar was about one week out of step with the seasons. The main motivation of calendar innovation was to keep our calendar matched to the seasons so that when we look at the calendar, we know where we are in relation to the changing seasons. The Gregorian calendar with its leap year system was introduced several centuries later. At that time, the date of the Pleiades culmination became known as November 21st. Astronomically, the Pleiades are a cluster of young stars that all formed in the same gas cloud. They are an example of an open cluster where the stars are gravitationally linked by their common origin. Eventually, over the millennia, they will separate and go each their own way due to chance encounters with other stars. The Pleiades are young, about a hundred million years old, formed during the time of the dinosaurs. They are very hot stars that would look bluish in color if we could see them up close. However, they are about 440 light years away, and it is hard to see that color with the naked eye at that distance. With the naked eye, we see usually six stars. However, the true number of stars in this cluster is more like a thousand. Most of them are too small and too dim to be seen without a large telescope. The dust cloud we see around telescope photos of the Pleiades is not the dust cloud they were born in. They have traveled quite a distance from that cloud, which has long since dissipated. The cloud we see now is a cloud they happen to be moving through by chance. The energy of their light causes this cloud to glow as a reflection nebula. The Pleiades are not a constellation. Rather, they are part of the constellation Taurus. However, their unique shape and close grouping earn them their own name and place in the mythology of many cultures around the world. In fact, many of these stories about this group count a lost seventh member 
even though we typically see only six. The legend of seven stars is seen in the stories of Romania, Holland, Australian Aborigines, early Mesopotamia, the Maoris, the Xi Indians of eastern Brazil, the Navajo, the Natchez, the Arapaho, and many others. The stories often include some reason why we no longer see the seventh member. There could be an astronomical basis for this widespread legend of a missing Pleiades star. Pleione, the seventh brightest star in the group, is now not typically visible to the unaided eye. This star is a shell star, surrounded by a bright gaseous ring or shell, and often changes brightness as some of this gas is expelled. So, in ancient times, this star may have been brighter, and those observers were routinely seeing seven stars instead of six. We should note that there are cultures whose myths only had six stars. These include China, the aboriginal Ainu of northern Japan, the Yurok and Tachi Yuhot Indians of California, and Polynesian people of the Cook and Hervey Islands. The Japanese themselves saw six stars and called the cluster Subaru. And indeed, six stars are seen on the automobiles of the Subaru Car Company. During October, the Pleiades rise after sunset, and so you have to wait a while after the fall of darkness to see them. Starting in November, they rise just at sunset, and as the year progresses, they rise before sunset, so that as soon as it is dark, you can see them somewhere in the evening night sky. They are toward the east in late fall, then moving to the south during early winter and toward the west in late winter and early spring. By looking for them at about the same time in the evening over the weeks, you can notice this progression from the east to the south to the west. And in doing so, you will be reenacting some of the earliest astronomical observations and experiencing the roots of STEM. We hope you get a chance to do this over the next few months. We'd also love to see you here visiting the Springfield Museum someday. If you like astronomy, check out our website for the Stars Over Springfield event and the AstroQuest web series, and you might even consider joining the Springfield Stars Club. Thanks for listening.